Hello again. This is the fourth and last video in a four-part series on four-part harmony. If you've made it this far, congratulations, we're nearly through. This video is going to be about how you can turn your four-part harmony into a full orchestral piece. Now, if you haven't watched the other videos, I would recommend doing so before watching this one. So our first video, I'll put a link to it up here, was on why I think four-part harmony is an essential skill for any composer. The second video was about the process of writing four-part harmony and some of the rules of counterpoint that go along with it. In the third video, I showed you where you can find some chorales to harmonize yourself, and we worked through a full example. And in this video, I'll show you various techniques that you can use to orchestrate your four-part harmony. Now, I will just warn you in advance, because I'm showing you lots of different techniques, uh, the end result is going to necessarily be a bit of a hodgepodge, uh, not necessarily the most musical result in the world, but hopefully it'll be instructive anyway. Now I'm using Finale with Note Performer, but if you want to follow along and make an orchestral arrangement of your own four-part harmony, you can use any notation software uh, as long as it has a realistic orchestral output or a DAW with a good sample library. So first, let's go over the three different arrangements of the Bach Chorale that we looked at last time. First, we have this Bach-style orchestration. Next, I prepared this sort of modern classical style arrangement that uses a lot of parallel fifths and non-diatonic chords. And finally, I made this sort of fun reggae style arrangement. So my goal in this video is to produce an entire piece using these three arrangements that I just showed you. Um, so I thought, okay, how can I possibly combine these very different arrangements into one cohesive piece? I'm not totally sure I succeeded, but you can judge for yourself. So I imagined this scene where, first of all, uh, we have some adventurers arriving on this remote island, uh, and they're welcomed by the locals, and there's a big party on the beach. That's the reggae theme. Then the adventurers have to hack their way through the jungle, right? Uh, and there's snakes slithering down the tree branches and so forth. That's the creepy modern sounding theme. Until they finally arrive in the mid middle of the jungle, there's the ruins of an ancient temple. Uh, and they finally found the thing they were looking for, and that's the big Bach uh, classically arranged theme. So you can judge for yourself if I, com if I combine these into one uh, piece successfully. We'll hear the entire thing at the end, and I'll show you the various techniques I use to orchestrate it along the way. Okay, so first up we have this reggae theme. Now, I have to confess, 
I am not very familiar with reggae or island style music. So the first thing I did is I listened to a bunch of it. I went on YouTube, listened to traditional island music, uh, some reggae tracks, things like that. And I determined, okay, what instrumentation do I need? What are some characteristics uh, that really define reggae um, and, and island music? So in this case, I determined that uh, island music and reggae had a lot of steel drums uh, often an acoustic guitar or, or uh, even sometimes an electric guitar, but uh, I decided I wanted an acoustic one just for a bit of a uh, different timbre. Oftentimes there was an electric bass and I kept that playing the bass line. Um, often marimbas, uh, shakers, conga drums, and other sort of percussion like that. So here's the beginning of my arrangement. I'll point out a few salient features. Now, I realize this is really small, so I'm going to zoom way in here and show you um, the details. So at the very beginning, I just have a quick wind run, which serves as a very, very brief, literally quarter note long introduction. So I have the winds playing this quick run, uh, as well as a suspended cymbal, and the bass guitar glisses down into its first note. All right, but here's the main body of the actual uh, of the actual setting here. So as you can see, I have the melody played on steel drums or steel pans, if you prefer calling them that. Um, and then the bass line is played here on electric bass. And as you can see, I just transcribed it directly from the original. The melody is exactly the same as this. The bass line is exactly the same as this. So where are the inner parts? Well, I put the inner parts on the marimba. So if you look at this, B, F sharp, D, and then you look at the marimba part, here you'll see B, F sharp, D. Yeah. So I'm assuming that the marimba player is comfortable with three or four mallet technique. Um, and really, this is a straightforward transcription of all of the notes that are in the original uh, with the melody and the two inner parts. Now, you'll notice that I left a bunch of the melody out because I really want that to be the focus of the steel drums. I also left out a few chords here. Okay, um, that's because I really wanted the marimba to hit on key notes and I felt like using all of the original harmony was a little too much. So I didn't do that. So that leaves the acoustic guitar. Now the acoustic guitar is actually not playing any of the lines of the original harmony. What it's doing is it's taking the chords that are being played at that point and just playing some guitar chords that would fit under the guitarist's fingers and also would fit exactly the harmony that's going on at that point. So B minor, F sharp major, and so on. And then the rest, uh, is simply a rhythmic accompaniment. So oftentimes in reggae music, the off beats are highly accented. So you'll see that the toms are playing on all the off beats, um, and many of the down beats, the first and third down beats. In addition, the conga player is playing a rhythm here. The last element of this is I do bring the flutes in right here. Now, I wanted to point one thing out. I say ah two here, and then there's a very faint ah one. Now ah one is not a real marking. You would never see that in a real score. Uh, you know, it means play with one player. Well, which player? <laughs> you you know. So um, so the reason that I have the ah one here is is simply for playback. So in note performer, uh, if you look at the definition of this expression, you can use special controllers like 104 to make it sound like there are two players playing. So with this ah one, I wouldn't actually need to mark anything in the score because there are two notes. The conductor would assume the first player is playing the top one and the second player is playing the bottom one. But note performer doesn't know that I've gone from two players to one. So here I've marked uh, controller 104 back down to zero. So that's just a way of affecting playback with note performer. The other thing to note is after this initial run, I want the third oboe player to go over to English horn, and we'll see that coming up later. He's going to have some, uh, some notes to play on the English horn. 
uh, in the creepy setting of the theme. Now, the line that the flutes are playing here isn't really in the original four-part harmony. So how did I get that? Well, if you look at the original four-part harmony, I took these chords, this chord, and then this chord, and then this chord, and some of these, and I made a line out of the key moments of those. So I kind of simplified the material here into a much simpler line that became an accompaniment texture in the overall setting. Uh, and finally, we need to transition to the next setting of the theme, right? It's rarely successful just to suddenly go from one to the other with no uh, transition whatsoever. So how are we going to do that? So the first thing I did is on the last few beats of the, of the reggae setting, I brought the entire orchestra in. Well, not all the winds, but I brought in the brass, I brought in the timpani, and I brought in the, um, the strings here. What that does is it sets up the listener's expectations so they realize there is an orchestra here too, not just the reggae band. So the other thing we do is when the theme ends, we go down to just the violins playing uh, tremolo here, which is a kind of suspenseful sound. And they go from playing forte to suddenly playing piano. While that's going on, the only other thing we have going is a little fragment of the melody in the marimba, the marimba to provide some continuity here, and then up here in the piccolo to provide some continuity with what's about to happen next. Now, this E sharp in the marimba is a tritone in B minor, which is unstable, and it gives it that sort of uncertain, unsettled feeling, which again causes suspense and causes the listener to think, well, what's coming next? Now, that's exactly what I want, because the thing that's going to come next is the creepy version of the theme. So first, let's listen to this piece up to the transition. Okay, now let's look at how I orchestrated the modern version of the theme. My goal in this one was really to capture that sort of creepy foreboding feeling uh, when the adventurers are going through the jungle, they're not sure what they're going to find. Uh, you know, there's snakes lurking around every corner, slithering down the branches and that sort of thing. So a lot of the orchestration choices that I made reflect that character. This is the original four-part harmony that I made. Now, the first thing I wanted to point out is I actually changed the last few little chords from last time. It just wasn't quite working for me, so I decided to change it. Now, what I decided to do with this one is I used a whole variety of very different orchestrations to, to orchestrate each phrase in this. So this has one, two, three, four, five phrases. Um, and what, it, what I did is I, I chose just a completely different set of instruments to orchestrate each one. The idea is that I could show you just a few different techniques that way that hopefully you can then take uh, and use in your own uh, orchestrations. So let's look at this first phrase here. As you can see, the accompaniment is just moving in parallel fifths here, up, and then, well, not quite parallel fifths moving downwards. So in the orchestrated version, I have the melody played by the tremolo first violins and then false harmonics in the second violins. And these will sound an octave above the tremolo that's going on. Uh, and that combination produces a very creepy, eerie sound. Okay, and then as you can see, I have the uh, parallel fifths here played by the violas, Divisia 3, uh, and then the ones going down played by 
cello and bass. Now I have those doubled up here by horns in the first instance and trombones in the second. And then I also am using the bass clarinet and contrabassoon. Contrabassoon has this low kind of growly sound and uh, the bass clarinet in its lower range has that wonderful kind of spooky sound, which I thought really would contribute to the, to the atmosphere there. And then, on, and you'll notice that it crescendos on this first phrase and then crescendos again in the second phrase to this forte piano. Uh, and on this very last note, I've got trumpets uh, playing muted here. Again, this fake A1 here, just because they were A3 earlier. Uh, and I need to tell a note performer um, that this should only sound like one trumpet playing each of these notes. It wouldn't show up in the real score. This is a hidden marking. So uh, again, on this, on this note, we have the trumpets decrescendoing and the oboes playing piano throughout, well, two oboes and an English horn. So what you'll actually hear is the trumpets getting softer, but you'll hear the oboes uh, taking over the sounds toward the end. Then on this next phrase, let's look at the original. So the melody goes B, C sharp, C sharp, F sharp, E, D. And then we have these, these chromatic runs going downwards in the alto, the tenor, and then the bass goes upwards. So I decided I wanted those to sound sort of like slithering snakes, right? So a very kind of creepy texture. So if we go back to the orchestrated version, so you'll see what I did is I actually moved the line that was underneath the melody way up top. So here, this is the piccolo playing uh, a good octave and a half or so above the melody. So I've doubled the piccolo here with the first violins. So we have the first violins and the piccolo playing in unison here. And then I join it here with the flutes. Now, if you look carefully, the original line looks just like it does in the piccolo. So it goes from this D up to a B flat. Right? It goes from this D up to a B flat. But I decided I actually wanted to continue that motion downwards and use this B flat an octave lower. So I put, I joined those two notes with a C between the D and the B flat. So this first flute is just going to continue the notes in the piccolo here. And likewise, I did that same thing in the first violin. So I just continue this chromatic run down and it sounds just kind of creepy. Now the melody here is played by the first oboe and the first clarinet. The bass is played by the first bassoon here. And the inner parts are played by, well, we already saw the alto part here, which I put above the soprano. Uh, and then the other part here um, is played by the second clarinet. Now I actually doubled just the very end of that with the second violin. Um, and that's because I wanted to introduce more of that string sound because the melody is about to be taken over by the string. So I'm transitioning from the winds to the strings here. The other thing I wanted to point out is that I seamlessly switched here from the violin playing an accompaniment line to playing the melody. Uh, and they start, they, this ends this line on the same note as it starts the next phrase of, of the theme here. Uh, so that's also a very effective technique that you can use to join from an accompaniment line into a, into a melody line and vice versa. Now on this next phrase, as I said, the first violin is playing the melody along with the first bassoon here, uh, an octave lower. So octave doublings like this are very common where you'll have either the uh, melody or the theme played by two instruments at once separated by an octave. 
And then I wanted this to sound sort of foreboding and like, ooh, what's going to happen next? So I switched the accompaniment over here to brass. So I have the horns and the tuba, which have a similar sort of sound. Um, yeah, if I use the trombones, for example, they have a more sort of strident sound. The, the horns and tuba sound similar, just like the trumpets and trombones uh, sound similar. So if you want to blend those tones, you want to use horns and tuba. So I have the tuba playing the bass line, and I have the horns playing the inner parts in octaves. And again, I'm playing with the dynamics a little bit. Mostly this is piano, but it crescendos up to a mezzo forte uh, on this final note. And I have the horns playing a stopped note here. And also on this last note, the uh, trombone and bass trombone join in, just to give it a little extra punch. Now this next phrase is the second to last one, so I wanted it to be fairly weak to provide room to build up on the last phrase. So it's mostly in piano winds, and as you can see, the range only goes from about a D here in the English one, it looks like an A, but English horn is transposing, it sounds, uh, it sounds a fifth lower, so this is a D. Uh, to this D sharp, two octaves lower, being played um, in the bassoons. So it's a narrow range of less than two octaves. And in fact, it gets narrower and narrower as it goes on to provide room for this to grow into this big crescendo here. So uh, this is, again, in the sort of quiet um, uh, range of all these instruments, low flutes, uh, English horn sort of in the middle of its range, uh, which is the quietest part of it, um, of, of oboes and English horns. Uh, you know, clarinets are able to play quietly in any, any part of their range, really, even, even the highest, although it's a little harder to play quietly in their higher range. So clarinet, bass clarinet, bassoons again in the middle of their range, which is the quietest part of their range as well. So uh, very quiet, and because it's quiet, I also wanted to introduce the fact that the strings were going to come in here and take over the melody. So I introduced some solo strings, not tutti, because I wanted it to be really blend well with the, with the solo winds. So I have a solo violist and a solo second violinist. Then finally, this last phrase, again, this is the big crescendo where the adventurers are about to f stumble onto their big ruin, right? So I wanted this to be a big dramatic crescendo. So first I started out by, by having the melody in the second violins, tutti again, not solo, because again, I want uh, to start increasing the volume. So I have it played on second violins and also on the trumpets here. So the other three voices are played by these horns here at first, as well as tremolo, violas, and cellos. Now why tremolo? Again, because I'm trying to build suspense, and that tremolo sound uh, gives us that, that kind of suspenseful feeling. And then you'll see I'm introducing more and more instruments as this goes on. So I introduce the first violins here. I introduce uh, a couple of trombones here. And then I introduce the, the, the fourth horn that wasn't playing. Uh, and then in the last measure, I introduce a bunch more winds here. So instead of just making a crescendo, which I do as well, I introduce more instruments, which increases the sort of weight of sound. The other thing I'm doing to make it sound bigger is I'm not just adding instruments. I'm increasing the range of the instruments that are included. So it starts out, again, just within about two octaves here, right, with this F sharp up to the C sharp, uh, here an octave and a half, and then I increase it a bit more here, and then even more here and more here, and then with the piccolo coming in now, it's up to a separation of like five octaves, okay? So you can tell something big is about to happen, and then there's this big crescendo. I will also point out, I didn't include the entire orchestra. There's no contrabassoon, no clarinets, no tuba, uh, just two percussion instruments playing, 
you know so i did not include everything i'm saving that for the very end of the piece it's always a good idea to hold something back for the big climax and then finally when you really reach the climax you throw everything at it now the final thing i wanted to point out is that in some of these lines i've actually pieced together multiple lines from the original so if we look at the original the melody goes down from this d down to the f sharp and then back up again but then there's this other line, which is on an F sharp right here, that keeps going down to this C sharp. So in the orchestrated version, the English horn looks like this. It starts on a D again. This looks like an A, but that's because the uh, English horn is a transposing instrument. So it starts on a D. It goes all the way down to this F sharp, but instead of going back up, which the bassoon does, it actually keeps going down. So I've stitched together two lines here. And that's a common technique that you'll find in Mahler and, and other composers all the time. The final thing that I've done is you may have noticed this line and this line don't actually exist in the original four-part harmony. So how did I get them? Well, this F and this A are in the original chords. I just joined them with a G. And then this A and F are in the original chord and this C sharp and A are in the original chord. So this is just an arpeggiated version of the chords that were already playing there. What I wanted to happen is I wanted this to get lower and lower as more instruments came in to, to increase this climax here. So I invented some additional lines that weren't in the original based on the original chords that were occurring at that time. So let's see what this section sounds like. Here we're coming off the reggae theme suspense. Moving trumpets. The slithering sounds. Now the foreboding. I want to have a place to crescendo from. And here's the big crescendo to the climax. So now the adventurers have finally arrived at the ruins they were looking for in the heart of the jungle. Maybe the, it's an ancient temple or a, a cathedral. I'm not sure. It has uh, an organ and church bells in it. I think it's unlikely that they run into the ruins of a cathedral in the middle of a jungle. But, you know, hey, dramatic license, right? Um, anyway... Uh, so the idea was that I wanted to produce a very different arrangement of this that sounded very grand uh, and would lead up to a big final ending. So in this part of the piece, I've just set the box style harmonization that we came up with last time. So that harmonization looks like this. Now, I've actually taken this exact part and I've just stuck it directly in the organ. So let's see what that looks like. So as you can see, I'm quoting that, that exact harmonization here in the organ part, exactly as it is in the original, with just a couple of small changes. The changes are, are as follows. So if you note right here, there's just an F sharp playing a half note. In the original, there's an F sharp and then a lower F sharp. The problem with that is that the organist's hands aren't big enough to actually reach all of the notes in this chord. So here we have a low F sharp, an A sharp, an F sharp going to an E, and a C sharp. So the C sharp to the A sharp is a tenth, and the A sharp to the F sharp is a tenth. You don't really want the organist to have to stretch more than an octave or maybe a ninth, so this really is too much. So instead, I took this low F sharp up an octave and just held this upper F sharp for a half note. So this comfortably fits under the organist's left hand.
So I didn't want to have just the organ playing here. So what I did is I also set the chorale in the brass in a very straightforward way. All of the all three trumpets are playing the melody. Then I put the inner parts in the horns in octaves and in the trombones. And then the bass trombone and the tuba are both playing the bass line an octave lower than in the original. Finally, the violins are playing this 16th note pattern here. The way I constructed this was by a simple pattern. Ba -ba 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 -bum. And I followed the notes of the melody. So B, B, A sharp, B, C sharp. You can see here B, B, A sharp, B, C sharp. So this pattern is based on that and with a little bit of variation like here, just for a bit of um, interest. Now, when there are big fermatas in the original, I held the notes several extra beats and then introduced some new material. So here I introduced the chimes and glockenspiel playing bum, 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 which is just an elaboration of that B minor chord. So this is holding a big B minor chord. And I have the glockenspiel, the chimes, and the acoustic guitar, because I figured I might as well bring them back in again, playing that line. And then the violins are just playing a B minor chord with a little elaboration as well. Meanwhile, here I bring in the winds, playing, again, a B minor chord in the piccolo and flutes. And then oboes and clarinets are just doubling what the chimes and glockenspiel are doing. I also bring in the bassoons and contrabassoons playing the bass line. It won't really add a whole lot. They'll be pretty hard to hear with all the brass playing, but I wanted them to have something to do. Also, since I had a bass guitar here, I decided to include the bass guitar playing the bass line as well. Now I've repeated this pattern several times. In fact, every phrase follows this same pattern. It has the chorale played in the organ and brass. And then on the long held notes, I have the chimes, glockenspiel, guitar, and winds all playing this pattern. Now on this particular phrase right here, let's look at the original chorale. You'll see this F sharp makes an interval of a ninth with the left hand. This E and F sharp are an inter interval of a tenth. But if we move those up into the right hand, that's just an octave, and that's just a sixth, and that's just a fifth. So what I did here is, in fact, I just moved those up into the right hand, just so it's easier for the organist to read. And it's assumed that this is one line. Now, now, this particular phrase ends in a C-sharp major chord, and the pattern that the chimes and glockenspiel are playing is based on a C major chord. So E-sharp, C-sharp, G-sharp. Those are the notes in a C-sharp major chord with the leading tones. The leading tone to an E-sharp is a D-double sharp. The leading tone to the C-sharp is a B-sharp, and the leading tone to the G-sharp is an F-double sharp. However, in the clarinets, the clarinets are in B flat, which means you have to transpose up a whole step. So that E double sharp here would have become an F double sharp, and the leading tone here would have, instead of a D double sharp, it would have been an E double sharp. So I thought that was just too hard to read. So instead, I respelled these notes as F sharp. G. So this is really a D flat major chord instead of a C sharp major chord in the clarinets. So that's just one thing to watch out for. If you have very sharp keys in the clarinets, you'll sometimes just want to make them very flat keys instead. And then the last thing I did is on the very last phrase, I actually had the pedal in the organ doubling the bass line, which enabled me to actually go down to this bottom F sharp, which I couldn't do in the left hand, otherwise it would have been out of range. Um, and then finally, 
uh, I just tacked on a bit of an ending here. So uh, after this B, B major chord, it goes C, C sharp, D sharp. And then there's a final crescendo to the very last note here. Now I'm not going to play this entire section because it's all arranged in a very similar way. Uh, but I will go ahead and play the first bit of it so you can see what it sounds like. So let's review all of the techniques that we've seen in the orchestrations today. So first, from the reggae theme, if you don't know much about the style of music you're trying to write, listen to a bunch of it, try to identify its characteristics, and then you'll have a much better idea of how to write that style. We saw how you could add rhythmic accompaniment like percussion. Third, you can have some instruments playing lines that are based on the chords in the original harmony rather than the actual lines. We saw that in the guitars and flutes. You can skip some notes in the accompaniment. And finally, we saw how you can transition into a new part of your piece, either gradually or suddenly, by fragmenting the theme and slowly introducing the textures and instruments in a new setting, supplanting the old one. In the creepy theme, we saw several techniques. So first, you can change the instrumentation of your orchestration throughout the entire theme. You can use octave doublings to create different textures. You can vary the dynamic level. You can put the accompaniment above the melody instead of below it. You can have lines that start with one voice, but switch in the middle into a different voice. And you can add lines that aren't in the original, based on chords in the original harmonies. Finally, based on the cathedral theme, we saw how you can actually directly quote the entire original four-part harmony if you're playing on an organ or a piano. You can add pauses in the counterpoint and insert material that's based on that chord, but isn't really part of the counterpoint. We saw that in the chimes and winds. You can add an ostinato or other fast notes that may be based on one of the voices in the counterpoint, or just the chords, or sometimes a contraction of the melody. We saw that in the first violins. You can combine consecutive occurrences of the same note into one long note. And finally, you can add an ending to make it feel like a complete piece. Now that we've reviewed all those techniques, let's listen to the entire piece from start to finish. Remember, we start out with a party on the beach, then our adventurers cut their way through the creepy jungle, and finally they end up at the ancient ruin. <laughs>
That's it for today's video. I hope you've enjoyed this series on four-part harmony, you know, why it's important, how you can make your own, and how you can use it in a real orchestral setting. If you enjoyed this, please drop a like on this video to help other people find it. Uh, you also might want to subscribe to my channel if you want to be notified when my next video comes out. As always, if you have any questions or feedback at all, please feel free to leave a comment. Uh, I, I do always read them. Uh, and I'll respond to as many as I can. Until next time, have a good one.